Good afternoon. My name is Leo, Pope Leo X of Rome. I was 37 years old when I became the Pope in 1513. I ruled for about eight and a half years until December 1st, 1521, when I died of pneumonia. You may wonder how I view my papacy, and I would say that it really went rather well. Well, except for that pesky monk up in Wittenberg, Germany, Martin Luther. But during my papacy, we expanded the Vatican Library. We continued on with the refurbishing of St. Peter's Basilica here in Rome. A beautiful place. Have you seen it? We brought in Michelangelo. We brought in Raphael to do painting and decorating. Have you seen the Sistine Chapel? It's worth coming all the way just to see what we've accomplished. But, as you can imagine, it cost a lot of money. And reality says the Vatican treasury was depleted. Some people accuse me of having spent too much money on too many things. But to take care of the treasury, to be able to finish the refurbishing, we went back to something that had been approved by councils down through the centuries, by other popes had done it, and that was to sell indulgences. Half of the money would go to pay off the bankers, the other half would go for the refurbishing. Indulgences. As you know, we as Catholics would have people come for private confession. And when they had confessed their sins, we would offer forgiveness, but recognizing that they still had to do something. And then I think you recognize that, that you too would feel better if when someone has forgiven you your sins, that they would say, now go and do this act of charity or go and do some fasting, or go and say the rosary so many times, or so many Our Fathers. And then the people could feel better about themselves and really feel that forgiveness that they wanted and, and desired. Well, that became so popular, except for that monk up in Wittenberg, and I think the truth is, he was just jealous. Jealous because the money was going to Rome to take care of St. Peter's rather than all staying there in Germany and going to the church that he was at. Well, because it went so well, we also said that people could buy indulgences to get themselves out of purgatory. Purgatory, another thing that he didn't seem to appreciate, this monk up in Germany. You know, the problem was, he was a monk, but then they made him a professor at the university in Wittenberg. And the special subjects that he was teaching was the Bible. And the more that he read of the Bible, the more he wanted to complain and, and think he was so smart and say that we in the church were doing this wrong or were doing that wrong. But as you think about it in terms of purgatory, for someone who has done great sins, shouldn't they have to pay for them in some special way? Certainly Jesus died to pay for sins, but Jesus, but Paul also said, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. And so purgatory certainly is the tribulation. In your time, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Saddam Hussein, 
Ask yourself, if they had come to believe in Jesus and ask for forgiveness just one week before they died, do you think they should just be forgiven everything and get heaven itself, or doesn't it make sense? Yes, they should pay for the things that they've done. And how many times haven't you said of somebody else, he's going to pay for that someday? But then with the indulgences, we gave people the opportunity that they could pay off, pay for the indulgence, and then a certain amount of time would be taken off how long they would spend in purgatory, or certainly they could not buy it for a loved one. Maybe for mom or dad or grandparents or a spouse or, or even a child. But then this Martin Luther comes along and says, no, that's not right. Nobody can buy their way into heaven. Heaven is by grace through faith. Not because of any works, not because of any buying. In fact, Martin Luther was so audacious as to say, you know, if the Pope could forgive sins and take time off of purgatory just by putting money in the clink, why doesn't he just open up purgatory for everybody and let everybody go free and, and be generous about it? Well, all of his teaching, all of his finding fault with what the councils had said, what popes had said through the years, we found it necessary to threaten him with excommunication. And certainly he knew that outside of the church, there's no salvation. But that didn't seem to bother him. And he says because as he reads the Bible, it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Well, then we decided to treat him as a heretic. A heretic to say anyone could put him to death and they wouldn't be found guilty. Or if we captured him, that we'd burn him at the stake, and he knew, we knew what we were talking about because a hundred years before, we had burned John Huss at the stake. But that didn't seem to bother him either. In fact, it got him looking more at what John Huss had said and the reforms that he wanted to have been taking place in the church, and he had agreed with him. And then he began to say, you know what? There should be changes in the church in terms of celibacy. There's nothing in Scripture that says that the priests have to remain unmarried. And then he points to Peter, the first pope, and says, look, he was married. Scriptures say he even had a mother-in-law. Then he started to change in terms of the Mass and in terms of the liturgy, the beautiful Latin liturgy. And he comes along and says, but people in Germany don't understand that. Let's put it in German. And then he says, it doesn't work just to have ex opere operato, just going through the motions does well enough, but it has to be in the heart. A person has to really believe what he's saying as he's singing hymns or as he's praying, as he's going through the liturgy. And in terms of purgatory, he likes to point to when Jesus was hanging on the cross and a couple thieves hanging there with him. And the thieves, realizing the evil that they had done, deserving to be crucified. But then as one turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me in your kingdom, to hear Jesus say, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. No purgatory. Ah, but then we come back and say, wait a minute, you've interpreted it wrong. 
Rather, Jesus was saying, truly I say unto you today, you will be with me in paradise, but we know that he's going to be spending a lot of time in purgatory first. What do you do with someone who doesn't accept the teachings of the council, who doesn't accept the teachings of the papacy, even when he speaks ex cathedra, matters of faith and morals? But he keeps going back to, but what does the Bible say? And then he stresses that Jesus has done it all. It's by grace that you're saved. It's only through faith in him. And it's in Christ alone, not because of our works. And he bases it all on scripture alone. Certainly, you wouldn't believe everything that he says. Or do you? <laughs> 